One of the neat things about drag racing is that over the course of the history of the sport, there have been specific cars which have had an indelible impact on the evolution of the activity. The flip-top Mercury Funny Cars of 1966, Don Garlitz and his rear-engine dragster in 1971, Grumpy Jenkins at his 1972 Pro Stock Vega. But what about the car that people have long accused of killing an iconic class in drag racing? Can a single car kill an entire class? That's the question I'm aiming to answer here. Is this the car that killed the gassers? Cars, like performance increases in drag racing, are all evolutionary creations. They're evolved by their owners, and the owner we need to talk about here is Ohio George Montgomery. Born in 1933, he opened George's Speed Shop in Dayton, Ohio at 17 years old. Working at a factory with his father and using the Speed Shop as a side hustle, he maintained this dual life until 1964 when he bailed out on factory work and operated the Speed Shop full-time. The valuable skills he had learned in tool and die making, machining, and metallurgy would pay him back in spades over the course of a hot-rotting life that was nearly without parallel in its size and scope. Despite his passing, George's Speed Shop, the oldest operating one in the country, continues in business in Dayton, Ohio. Our story truly begins in earnest in 1959, when just prior to the NHRA Nationals in Detroit, George bought and built a 1933 Willys race car. This machine bucked the popular trend of using the 40 or 41 Willys body or even the more popular pre-war Ford Coupes, which are in wrecking yards everywhere and could be had for virtually nothing. The Little Willys was dimensionally smaller than the Ford's or later Willys models, and it was lighter to boot. Powered by a 414 cubic inch Cadillac engine that had been taken out from 390 cubic inches, using a stock Willys frame that had been lightened, yes lightened, a Pontiac rear axle and a hydromatic transmission, along with the rudimentary suspension and tire technology of the day, Montgomery destroyed the competition, winning the U.S. Nationals with this combo in 1959, 1960, and 1961. At the 1959 race, he shot the national prominence with a top speed for the A-Gas Supercharged category, running 132.65 miles per hour in Detroit. In 1960, he showed up with the same car, now equipped with a coilover-style front suspension, which freaked the tech guys out to no end, but it worked. The jacked-up stance allowed him to run 11.53 at 130.57 miles an hour, winning class and the Little Eliminator category. This would set a precedent for him personally that would come into huge play just a few years down the road. A 1963 NHRA rules change made Montgomery reconsider his engine choice. Out went the big 414 cubic inch Cadillac, and in went a small block Chevy that displaced 375 cubic inches, about 40 less than the Cadillac. This allowed the car to run at a lower weight. Combining that fact with some smart innovations in the suspension of the car, Montgomery now had a machine that could outpace the much larger and heavier Chrysler Hemi power plants for the front half of the racetrack and stave off their huge charge on the back half of the quarter mile as well. Remember, to this point in our story, Ohio George was still working his factory job, running his speed shop, and traveling as judiciously as he could with his race car, which was now known nationally as the world's wildest willies. All that would change in 1964 when he left the job at the plant and went hot-rodding full-time, much to the consternation of his parents who didn't understand that this burgeoning sport and industry would not only be good to their son, it would embrace him for the balance of his life. By 1965, Montgomery was nationally known and nationally touring with a roving band of gasser heroes who were at the height of their power and fame in the midst of the famed gasser wars. The public loved these cars with their wild appearance, great performances, and drivers who were mixing it up in the public via drag racing papers and magazines of the day. As much as trash talking gets people riled up in modern drag racing, it worked like a charm back then as well. It seems strange to say in the context of modern drag racing, but at this time in history, the best gasser racers were as well known as the best top fuel racers. There were also a growing contingent of guys running nitro engines at full-body cars, but that was a seemingly oddball trend that would die out as people got frustrated trying to make cars with too much power and weight work on the track. Right? Perhaps it was the match racing circuit, perhaps it was just a touch of hubris, or perhaps it was just a dude who didn't have any spare time, but Ohio George got stuffed at the 1965 NHRA Nationals. It was the first time he had lost a round since 1959. By his own admission, he had hung on to the small block Chevy for one year too long, and he was no longer the guy with the hot hand and the hottest combo. Jack Merkel, the great East Coast racer, had embraced the then-new Mark IV big block Chevy and toppled Ohio George with it, garnering headlines and launching Merkel into the stratosphere as a gasser hero. Like Montgomery, Merkel was an engine builder who spent his whole life in the sport. Upon returning to Dayton, Ohio, Montgomery contacted Charlie Gray, who ran Ford's motorsports program, and inquired about engines. Gray offered small blocks, Montgomery wanted a 427 single overhead cam engine, or nothing. 
These engines were so new and rare that they couldn't send him a complete one, so parts literally arrived as they were made. A cylinder head one day, a timing chain the next, and over that time he got all the parts he needed and assembled the engine using his skill as an engine builder to complete the job with no factory manual or guidance. The physical size of the engine required Montgomery to mildly modify the nose of the willies with bulges so that the valve covers could nestle into them. He had to make his own bell housing with a reverse mount starter and generally tweak the car from end to end to make sure the huge 427-inch single overhead cam blown engine could get as much power as it made to the ground. While these engines had been used in fuel dragsters and other heavy-duty nitro-burning cars, no one had put one in a gasser yet, so there were many questions left to be answered. And then, they went to the track. The car was bestial and almost immediately in testing capable of making runs in the neighborhood of the national record. The world got to see this car in 1966, and they were not disappointed. The unique nature of the engine and car combo, the fact that it was Ohio George, and the fact that Ford was behind it, made this machine a media darling. Every inch of the car was featured in magazines monthly, fans flocked to see it at match races, and once again, it destroyed at the U.S. Nationals. The king of the gassers was back on his throne. And this is where our story gets very interesting, because a lot of fascinating things happened between the car's introduction and all that winning. The first was an invite to the Ford wind tunnel to see just how bad the 1933 Willys body was aerodynamically. This was done during the 1966 season, and the results were terrifying. Montgomery claims the little car was experiencing 600 pounds of rear lift at 125 miles an hour, meaning it got worse as the car went faster, and he was going way faster. This phenomenon, which in effect was trying to lift the rear end of the car off the racetrack at speed, explained the ill-handling characteristics the Willys had at the top end and its nature to use the entire lane left to right while going through the traps. The whole car was so bad aerodynamically that even the engineers were shocked. A radical roof chop in the offseason was made to do something to improve its condition, but that was basically a drop in the ocean. The second thing that happened was far more important. Not too long after the wind tunnel session, Montgomery was at a Ford factory function with his car. Charlie Gray, the man who ran the motorsports program, introduced him to a Ford vice president named Donald Fry. According to Montgomery, Fry looked at his car and said, I thought we sold Fords. Fry was ready to pull the plug on support right there on the spot, but quick thinking Gray had an idea. Ford was set to produce a small run of 1967 Mustang Fastback fiberglass bodies for the newly popularized funny car category that their Mercury division had helped Quantum Leap ahead with their flip-top Comets. Montgomery was offered one. Smartly, he leapt at the chance. Montgomery would then work hand-in-hand -hand with Bill Farmage's Muke, the man in charge of the NHRA's tech department, to make sure this new Mustang would be legal to the letter of the rules. Over the years, the gassers were at first limited to American car bodies only, and then foreign cars were allowed in, but there was never a rule against using a late model style car. This Mustang was set to be the first true late model in the history of the class. That being said, per the rules, the car still needed to be underpinned with an automotive frame. Having many laying about and working in concert with Dismuke, Montgomery chose a 1933 Willys frame to underpin the Mustang. Weird but true, the decision met the letter of the rules. All of this was happening out of the prying eyes of the media and the public who had seen Montgomery run the Willys at the 1967 NHRA Winter Nationals. There were rumors that he was going funny car racing like so many other gasser heroes had done, also rumors that he was building some sort of a gasser doomsday weapon, but nobody had hard facts. And then he rolled into the gate at the 1967 NHRA Spring Nationals with the Mustang. The tech department freaked, the public freaked, and the car, with its far superior aerodynamics, lower center of gravity, much improved suspension, and even hotter motor, was an immediate destroyer. The Mustang smashed deep into the eight seemingly at will, months ahead of anybody who could even begin to think of that type of performance. That said, it was kind of impossible not to recognize that the 1967 Mustang Gasser looked a lot like the 1967 Mustang funny cars that were louder, smoked the tires harder, and ran way faster. The problems of 1965 regarding fuel-burning engines and full-bodied cars were not solved, but they have been greatly reduced. The funny cars were not just coming on strong, they were threatening to envelop the entire sport like a blob. Within months of the Mustang's debut, the NHRA had changed the rules again and allowed full tubular chassis for the gas supercharged cars. This opened the floodgates for a massive influx of late model body styles from Opals to Corvettes, Barracudas and more. It also helped some of the older body styles like Austin's continue to be competitive by lowering their center of gravity and vastly increasing the efficacy of their suspension and drivability. The cars that dove into the class were machines like the Camaro of Ron Hassel, Mike Mitchell's Corvette, the Malakote Brothers Barracuda, Brad Anderson's Dart, and a whole bunch more. As hard and fast as the late model machines came into the category, the nation was going absolutely crazy over funny cars. 
the manufacturers who were typically promoting their stock and super stock competitors were all over the funny car craze, making rock stars of their drivers and further increasing the public's anticipation for seeing not only local, but national funny car stars arriving at their home drag strips. The gassers were immediately beginning to feel the pressure. This despite the fact that by the end of 1967, Montgomery was running 850s at over 165 miles an hour in his Mustang. The Malco Mustang Gasser won the U.S. Nationals in 1967 and 68. For 1969, Montgomery built a new car which had a blown Boss 429 in the nose. This car was not near the success story of the Malco Mustang with its single overhead cam engine in it, but that all changed in 1973 and 74 when he changed the blower out for turbochargers and won the Gator Nationals back-to-back -back before the NHRA tech department kindly told him they had no interest in ever seeing the car again. But all this is aside, the question we have to answer here is whether or not the Malco Mustang Gasser killed the Gasser class. Clearly, it did not. And the car has been given this bum rap through history by people who don't know any better and want a quick answer to a historical question without any context. Yes, back in the day, Ohio George said that the late model body was a mistake, but he's more often quoted as saying, and what is obviously correct here, is that the rise of the funny car killed the gasser as a premier attraction at drag strips. In drag racing, when two cars carry the same appearance, even if just roughly, the one that is faster and more dangerous sounding is going to carry the attention of the public. The natural evolution of gasser racing was followed here. Montgomery didn't do anything that half a dozen other people were working on at basically the same time with the same idea. He just got it done first. Had Montgomery's Mustang never come to pass, the class full of Willys, Austins, Anglias, and Fords would have met the same fate. In fact, there were multiple major factors here. The funny cars were one of them, but the changes made to the class when it was lumped into Super Eliminator by the NHRA in the later 60s the mixing of the AA Street Roadsters with the gassers, and the continued dilution of the rules to define what a gasser actually was confused people, and many fans moved on following the funny car class or the new pro stock class or others of the time. Montgomery and a small number of the best, most well-known gasser titans managed a strong match race schedule for a few seasons in the late 60s and early 70s, often running multiple races per week for the majority of a season. But even those days began to get thin by 1970 when track started promoting blown gas funny cars as opposed to calling them gassers anymore. And beyond that, the localized gasser scene in Southern California was still active, but a shell of its former self, the big names having all gone funny car racing. So for all of you out there saying that this is the car that killed the gasser era, replace that one with this, or this, or this and you'd have a far more correct assessment of the situation. The Gassers were the perfect main attraction in drag racing for a shining moment in the front half of the 1960s. But like all things, times change, preferences change, and nitromethane rules the day. Thanks for watching. Like and subscribe for more videos and content.